Ask virtually anyone to list their favorite flowers, and you'll find that roses are always right up there at the top. They possess such an undeniable beauty. Now you may think that growing roses is really complicated, but it's not. I've got a recipe for success that'll keep you growing these beauties for years to come. Plus, I'll take you to an experimental growing region in California where a rose expert is following his dream of a hardier rose by growing this, the dream rose. And I'll show you how one man has made a business out of selling fresh rose petals. Sam McGreedy was the great breeder out of uh, Northern Ireland. He's now retired in New Zealand, and Sam used to repeat, give me a plant, I can always put a flower on it. And it's <laughs> easy enough to put a tea bloom on an excellent plant one or two generations, and you can do it. There are those who believe growing roses has become too difficult, but one plant breeder has decided to do something about it. Jerry Toomey has applied a lifetime of plant breeding to create a new, healthier tea rose called the Dream Rose. It's more disease resistant and designed to help garden enthusiasts spend less time caring for their roses and more time just enjoying them. Essentially, I've been breeding for, to improve the plant on roses. What's happened to the flower uh, is that the show people have dominated the publicity. They wanted a single and one bloom on a single stem, the high tea, they could nurse it and baby it. So the plant breeders, to meet that, that demand or that artificial demand, bred for blooms only. Now in plant breeding, you get what you select for. They'd spray in the greenhouse, spray in the field, until roses have got to be difficult to grow, put it mildly. The average person said, I had bad luck last year with my roses. It it wasn't bad luck, it was just bad plants. Jerry, what is different about your breeding program than those, uh, let's say, from Canada and the Midwest where they're breeding for cold hardiness? I've used different, basically different species. I've emphasized the Ragosa, the hardy one from Russia that'll take 40 below and virtually immune to disease. I've used the Wichuriana creeper that grew on the shores of northern Japan at roots as it goes along. One plant can cover 50 feet. I wanted to get own rooting ability back in these roses, as well as health. So after 20 years of breeding and, and, and observing the roses, you, you brought them up here to an area that um, is uh, conducive to disease, laid them out here and said, okay, you know, the ones that survive, survive, and the ones that fall off, fall off, and the ones that did survive, you took those as your parent stock, and now you've started this whole uh, crossing or breeding operation. Well, I, I was breeding from day one, introducing species blood, but then you get a large population, maybe 25, 30,000 seedlings a year, you'll select down to 1,000 maybe, then plant them up here with no spray and let nature take its course. The interesting thing of this climate in Watsonville, it's about the same as North Europe, black soil, never too hot, never too cold, but the diseases are there 12 months of the year mutating and working for you. The simplest thing in plant breeding is let nature, nature do the selecting for you if you give her a chance. Tell me about some of the highlights of your career. Well, I think the rose that's given me the most satisfaction is Audrey Hepburn. The, the uh, Hague in Holland is... This the, is Audrey Hepburn? This is Audrey Hepburn. Oh, it's beautiful. These are young plants, and it just produces a mass of bloom. It's uh, almost like a bouquet all summer. These plants will get up about four to five feet. Now, the, now this is an award winner. Yes, the Hague in Holland is the outstanding international test there's only been three American roses that have won there. Queen Elizabeth, which is universal still, a yellow that uh, has sort of dropped out of commerce. And then Audrey Hepburn got a gold medal. The second year got another gold medal for perfume. 
Why did you name it Audrey Hepburn? Well, a, a wonderful actress and a wonderful name for a rose. And I was in the Huntington Gardens uh, when the, I got word that the crew that had done her 12 uh, Gardens of the World film wanted an outstanding rose to name after her. She was Dutch extraction, and this had won in The Hague, so the story all came together. It's been a happy situation. Some roses sort of get a little poorer as they get older. Others just get a little better every year, and this is one that seems to improve with age. Jerry, you know, one of my favorite roses is, a, is Iceberg. It's, you know, popular all over, and, uh, but I do have to spray for it. I'm surprised that you have to bother spraying Iceberg. It's the number one rose in the world. Yeah, but it'll get black spot for me. Uh, a bit. I, out here, we can find the odd leaf as they age at the bottom, a bit of black spot, but it's a survivor that it'll keep blooming and blooming. Now, this is one of yours, a white one. This is one I have a lot of hope for. This is a seedling of iceberg by the Dream Orange, which is one of the healthiest roses ever. So you took white iceberg and crossed it with your Dream, with orange, dream orange and came up with this. Uh, this is a, a tea bloom, a beautiful center. It's, uh, it drops clean. Well, maybe I'll have to try one of these. We'll and get see you how some it seedlings. We're going to propagate this one immediately. And my dream has partially come true anyway. We're testing the best of my seedlings now worldwide, and the reports are encouraging. We're not perfect, but we're getting better. Jerry tells me that dream roses are becoming available in garden centers around the country. So now you too can chase your dream. Rose, that is. Coming up next, I'll show you how to select the best tea rows and share a tried and true recipe for planting. So stay tuned. Everyone loves roses, and more and more people are growing their own these days. You know, it's really not as difficult as you might think, and the rewards for your efforts are, shall I say, nothing less than spectacular. I've found that growing roses successfully begins with making the right selection, and it's important to know that these hybrid patented varieties are divided into three categories or grades, one, one and a half, and two. Even though they're usually a little more expensive, I go for the number one grade because the plants are larger and more robust. You see, they just seem to perform better for me in the garden, producing more flowers a bit earlier. Now, virtually all of these roses are shipped bare root. And what they do is they pack them in a loose soil. This is just for shipping. So when you pull them out of the box, the soil falls off the roots like this. Don't be alarmed. When choosing a location for the plant, you want to make sure it gets at least six hours of sunlight and plenty of air circulation. And it's a good idea to have your hole prepared ahead of time because you don't want any of these little fibrous roots to dry out from wind or too much sun. The next step to success is getting the soil just right. Over the years, I've come to rely on a simple recipe that really works. To two buckets of the soil I remove from the hole, I just add one bucket of peat moss, a half a bucket of dried cow manure, and half a bucket of compost or cottonseed meal. When I have all of these basic ingredients blended together, I add a little special touch in the way of either a half a cup of superphosphate or a full cup of bone meal, and then I add one tablespoon of Epsom salt. The positioning of the rose in the hole is critical, and it depends on where you live. You see, this bud union is the most susceptible part of the plant, and if you live in areas where you have extremely cold winters, you'll want to bury it about one to two inches below the surface of the ground for protection. But in milder parts of the country, you can actually plant it with a bud union about an inch to an inch and a half above ground level. With the plant positioned, I fill the hole with a solution of root stimulator and fish emulsion, and then fill in the soil. Now, I know this may not look like much now, but just wait until June. It'll be covered with flowers. For St. Valentine's Day, there's no better way to put a smile on someone's face than to give them fresh flowers. And I suppose the bloom of the day would have to be the rose. 
But there's so many varieties of fresh flowers to choose from, any of them would be a treat. If you receive some of these beauties, of course the name of the game is to make them last as long as possible. And there are actually some things you can do that work. For instance, feeding them. Even though these have been cut, nutrient is still important. Begin by preparing a solution of lukewarm water to about the same amount of lemon-lime soda and a couple of teaspoons of bleach. The sugar in the soda actually serves as the food, and the citric acid helps the flour take up the food more efficiently. And the bleach, well, it just keeps the water clean. Now, you can get these little packets from the florist which serve the same purpose, but this is just a simple homemade recipe that's always worked for me. Now, it may seem odd that one should have to feed their cut flowers, but it really works. A couple of years ago, I did an experiment. I put one bouquet of roses in the solution and the other in just plain water. Those put in the solution stayed beautiful for four to five days longer. Before you slip the flowers into the solution, remove the lower leaves like this, and then I always recut the stems underwater at a slight angle. This seems particularly helpful with roses. It's also important to know that they'll stay fresher longer, no matter what the flower is, if you'll keep them as cool as possible and out of a sunny window. I always seem to be drawn to processes that make good use of everything involved. I guess that's one of the reasons I'm so attracted to gardening. Nothing has to go to waste. This can apply to every aspect of gardening, even to enjoying beautiful roses. Now every industry has its byproducts, and the floral trade is no exception. When you're growing beautiful long stem roses for cutting, you have to wonder about some of the ones that, like this one, that are a little past their prime. No need to worry, there's a home for them as well. There's a big market out there for fresh rose petals, but this is nothing new. We've been using rose petals in celebrations since before Roman times. And one man who probably knows a lot about celebration is wine and rose connoisseur Jack Galante of Galante Winery and Vineyards in California. He's discovered a way to take the byproducts of one industry and create an entirely new business. But it's not wine we're talking about in this case. Our main business is our winery business, of course. Our vineyards, first of all, and then the winery came later. So uh, we grow uh, ultra-premium Cabernet Sauvignon grapes, and we specialize in Cabernet Sauvignon wines. The roses are really a complement to the vineyards and the winery. About 1985, my dad started planting roses just around the vineyards to beautify the vineyards. He grew up in the old country and he saw these uh, roses at the end of all the grapes. Um, because as you know, roses used to be used as monitors for pests and mildew right. and things in the, uh, for the vineyards. Sure. And we started planting so many roses and putting so much labor into them and we were giving roses away as fast as possible <laughs> that we uh, finally uh, decided to sell them. We grow about 90 varieties of roses right now. Um, however, uh, we don't necessarily advertise to customers that we're selling 90 varieties. What we sell the roses as is by color. So we help our, uh, the end user, the customer, uh, with what colors they want. Now, most of the roses you grow here are hybrid teas. All the roses we grow here are hybrid tea, as a matter of fact, yes. We don't do any of the old roses. Uh, we find um, they are absolutely gorgeous, as you know, a uh, little more difficult to ship and all. And so we really specialized in the hybrid tea roses. We run a lot of different events here at the property, so we used a lot of our roses for the events. We started doing concerts here as well. In the summer, we do quite a few concerts, and we started using a lot of rose petals. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, at our concerts, we use entire dance floors made of rose petals. On our day of wine and roses, we have 
rose petals everywhere. And Perfect. so we found that there was a market for rose petals. Everybody thought these rose petals were beautiful. And so now I think we might be one of the only people who do ship rose petals all over the states for special events. Now, you think of a flower petal as being very perishable. How do you ship petals? Well, the rose petals, as a matter of fact, are quite hardy. And so, literally, when we come out and harvest the petals, we do it mostly early in the morning. Uh, not too early if there's any dew on them because you don't want to harvest them wet. Yeah, so too much moisture would harbor disease. Exactly, and also when you, when you uh, package them, it could create heat, and then, of course, you get mold. They're also a, a, a product that you really uh, don't hold for a long time. When they're shipped, they're used. Yeah. Because, because they are used for special sure, events. Sure, right. So once you get the petals boxed, Jack, what, what happens after that? Well, the uh, rose petals are then, they're boxed in 30 pound uh, boxes and uh, with gel iced inside. And uh, those are, we charge about $100 a box plus shipping. They're shipped overnight to the destination. And uh, then the people who receive them, we instruct them, if they can, put them in a cold or cool area, uh, spread them out so rot doesn't start, and then when they're ready to use them, just spread them, you know, really just directly before they're going to be used, depending, of course, if they're used inside or outside, and, uh, and enjoy it. Yeah, just celebrate. Celebrate, That's absolutely. That's great. I found that there's an aspect of gardening that makes some people a little uneasy, and that's pruning. They're not sure when to make the cut, or how much to cut, or if it'll hurt the plant. But actually, good pruning practices are a part of good gardening. You can actually help invigorate a plant, help it last longer for many years, and perform better if you prune them properly, and at the right time. And there's no better example of this than the hybrid tea rose. We've all seen them. These picture-perfect, large, full-bodied blossoms. It's easy to see why they're so popular, because they'll bloom like this until the first signs of cold weather. There's really nothing to pruning these guys, but you want to start with the right tools. All you'll need is a good pair of sharp bypass or scissor-type pruners. And I like to use at least one glove to help protect my hands when I stick them through these thorny stems. The first to go are any dead or damaged canes, and I always remove any of these stumps from previous years. Now this next step may seem a little radical because I'm going to cut the entire plant down to about 24 inches or roughly knee height. I'm going to do this because it's actually good for the plant and it'll make it easier to work. Then I'll identify three to four of the strongest canes and remove all of the others and take out any limbs that crisscross because you see this will help ventilation and air circulation is very important. As I prune, I make my cuts at a slight angle, about a quarter of an inch above an outwardly facing bud. Once you finish pruning, it's important to seal the ends of the canes. This will do a couple of things. It'll help them shed water. and It'll keep insects from getting into the center of the cane and damaging the plant. You can use a pruning sealer for this, or clear nail polish will work just as well. Pruning a rose only takes a few minutes, but the result can be a much stronger, more vigorous plant throughout the year. Now, when you prune, you may discover that some plants just aren't worth keeping. Like this little guy. It looks like his best days are already behind him. This is a good time of year to make replacements and you'll find nurseries have the best selection. I also like to feed them now, just before those red leaves begin to appear. So as you've seen, with just a little effort, some persistence, and a few tricks of the trade, you too can enjoy this beauty we call the rose in your garden. So the next time the season rolls around, pick up some roses and plant them. Who knows, you may even dream up your own variety to showcase to the world. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. <laughs>
this garden I dream of a bed of flowers bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh But smile